Dear Thomas, first of all, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your extraordinary hospitality. You have been a great host and we have enjoyed the two days together already. Uh, I will speak as announced on chosen people in the American civil religion. Now, as you all know, this is not exactly a new topic. Uh, and why then did I choose to talk about this cornerstone of American identity? Uh, a year ago, I was asked by the Faculty of Theology at Heidelberg to talk about this very topic on the occasion of an award ceremony for the award for theological promise, for theological promise. The young scholars from uh, Finland, Germany, Israel, United Kingdom and the United States received this award in the appreciation of outstanding dissertation or other publications on the topic of God and spirituality, God and spirituality. I was asked to give the lecture because the theologians obviously wanted to come to grips with America's special mission of freedom, their relationship to God, war, providence and history. God, war, providence and history. The challenge forced me to think again about this subject which has fascinated me for a long time and to integrate new findings, new literature. And I especially would like to mention two recently published books, God and War, God and War, American Civil Religion Since 1945, published by Raymond Habersky in 2012, and The American Apocalypse, A History of Modern Evangelicalism, published by Matthew Sutton in 2014. Uh, Mr. Sutton just has finished a stint as a one-year fellowship at our university, and I think he gave a lecture in our class. Very interesting. We had a long talk about it. So what I present is what I have to uh, tell to the theologians. Individuals and nations, in, in the process of defining their own identities, seem to have a hard time tolerating the ideas of being mere, merely equals of others or being near equal to others. They attempt to arrogate to themselves some special significance that is supposed to render them different from and superior to other individuals or nations, indeed to make them unique. In the process, they frequently invoke notions of exalted generality, such as God, history, providence, progress, or the salvation of mankind, or capitalized, of course. Like so many citizens of them, so, so many other empires and nations before them, and even along with them, Americans too have claimed to be a chosen people. The idea of America's special mission has been a self-evident aspect of its political culture since the founding of the nation. The founding fathers were shaped by the spirit of the Enlightenment, as you all know. They integrated the Christian missionary ideas of New England settlers, the chosen people, the covenant people, God's new Israel, and God's last American Israel. It was the idea of a secular mission for America. It was this fusion of Protestant Christianity and enlightenment that brought forth the civil religion so specific to America, that unmistakable mixture of Christian republicanism and democratic faith that created a nation with a soul or a church. The American nation has no ideologies, she herself is one. She herself is one. The goals of American missions have, of course, varied over time. They have combined with the dominant aspect of the contemporary zeitgeist, only to them decouple themselves from it again. They have transformed, moving from the puritanical mission of completing the work or the information to the political mission of bringing freedom and democracy see, to the world. Or in the words used by President Woodrow Wilson in his declaration of war against Germany in 1914 to make the world safe for democracy. Thus, the missionary goals of the United States changed from the passive notion of turning America into a new Jerusalem, whose example would be the beacon for the world, to the active missionary duty to elevate backward, less civilized nations to the American level, to create a new world order, a safer world, and bring about the millennium. 
In order to, real, to be realized, every sense of mission grounded in the teleological view of history requires some concrete negation, some counter principle, an evil empire that has to be overcome by war if necessary, to the greater, greater glory of God, the true faith, the nation, the class, the society, racial purity, whatever the professed millennial aspect might be. The enemy can be the foreign barbarian, it can be the antichrist or the Christ, the capitalist, the communist, the fascist, or has been often been the declared enemy, the Jew. Personally, I am increasingly affected by what you might call old age pessimism. Obviously, most humans cannot live without enemy perceptions. Look around in today's world, it seems to be easy for dictators, autocrats, and political systems to create and exploit enemy perceptions. Putin's in Russia is a case in point, and we see it elsewhere. Missionary zeal cultivates radical dualism. It has to divide the world and its governing principle into good and evil. And this dualistic system of belief is known as Manichaeism, named after Amani, the Persian philosopher of late antiquity. The American civil religion has likewise developed its necessary enemy, one that requires that the nation have the soul of the church to survive. A nation with the soul of the church uh, can only justify entering an actual war on ideological grounds. It cannot fall back on material interests, reason of state, or how we dictate to a violation of the balance of power. As best, Manichaeism can refer to a violation of right, because in this kind of reasoning, legality and morality are interchangeable. Thus, whoever gets involved in a conflict or war with the United States is automatically caught up in what I've called the Manichaean trap, the Manichaean trap of America's sense of a special mission. Among Germans, uh, the word, very word Manichaean trap has become a trick, my, my trademark, so to speak. The Indians, as you all know, were the first enemy caught in this trap. It was with them that the battle for territory was waged most for, for, voraciously, ferociously, particularly after the greatest catastrophe took before the England King's Philip's War in 1675 to 1676. The Indians managed nearly to destroy the New England settlers in a war that, in relation to the total number of inhabitants, was the most bloodiest conflict in American history. From that point on at the latest, the Indians were perceived as savages who could not be civilized, indeed as devils. The wilderness was equated with hell. The Indians had lost any right to stand in the way of the conquest of the West. A conquest that was put ahead during the 19th century by the massive employment of troops and capital, and he knows much more about that. <laughs> this Manichaean pattern of the ideology and mythology of the Indian Wars has determined the foreign policy of the United States throughout its history, up to and including the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush. All enemies of the United States were caught caught in this Manichaean trap. After the Indians came the French and the British, and America's first political bestseller on the fame, common sense, and the Thomas James Declaration of Independence, it was King George III who embodied the evil principle. Later, it was the Spanish and American and Mexicans, and in the 20th centuries, the Germans, the Japanese, the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, the Iraqis, and today, the terrorists. The perpetually recurring self-assuredness of the colonists and the Americans about their special mission of freedom, their relationship with God, problems in history, has been clearly shown over the last 400 years. The ongoing discourse, as we would say today, about the American Trinity, the American Trinity of God, country, and freedom, God, country itself, belongs to the core of American identity. Despite avowed and pointed criticism of many aspects of their own history, the majority of Americans still today celebrate the greatness of their past with robust self-confidence 
an expression of their chosenness and uniqueness, and at the same time, a mandate for the future. Then we, we, we fulfilled so much of mission of expanding freedom. Public rituals and the American culture of remembrance are saturated with civil rituals and language, particularly the speeches of nearly all American presidents. And the history of the President of the United States seem to confirm a very bold hypothesis that constant cultural traditions can become so strong as to be indistinguishable from genetic traits that I start to think about the American identity. It has more or less become genetic. Among the sacred texts of the American civil religion are the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Gettysburg Address. In a stroke of genius, Abraham Lincoln, um, 1963, speech establishing the military cemetery at Gettysburg, in mere 273 words, transformed the Civil War into a battle to renew the missionistic idea of freedom under God. That we quote from the address, that we, are, that we hear high resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this mission under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I need some water, I'm sorry. I now want to talk about the period from 1945 to the present. The most recent era, the continuous struggle of American with their civil religion, with the conceptions of the relationship between God and American war, has once again intensified. Not only did the US spearhead the Western effort in the Cold War against the atheist, the atheist communist evil empire, as in President Reagan's graphic phrasing, but the US was almost constantly embroiled in hot wars. In Korea, Vietnam, Iraq twice, the air war against Serbia, Afghanistan, very smaller conflicts in Latin America and Africa, not to mention the ongoing drone war against terrorists around the world. We can see three consequences from this recent era of civil religious struggle. The first, all presidents, from Harry S. Truman to George W. Bush and Barack Obama, have, particular, have articulated the relationship among America, God, and war in different ways that I'm going to show. As this unfolded over the period from 1945, this successive articulation have revealed the paradoxes of America with particular clarity. The majority of Americans have been and remain convinced that their country has never led a war of aggression that they have held true to their mission of freedom and peace. At the same time, we can see that the United States has become a militarized state with unrivaled military resources and weapon systems on land, on water, in the air, in space, and now also in the digital realm. Throughout, God was almost rhetorically there. One could say that an integral part of American culture is based on the violation of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not take my name in vain. The second consequence. The early Cold War was certainly important for the full integration of non-Protestant denominations into the American mainstream. The enthusiastic participation of some Catholic theologians and other religious uh, dignitaries in the blessing of the American opposition to the Soviet Union helped complete a process that had begun several decades ago, previous the incorporation of a Judeo-Christian identity at the core of the American identity. The basic is a 20th century invention. invention. The third consequence, the relationship between God, war, and American civil religion have have been, foc been the focus of historians, American studies scholars, sociologists, theologians, clergy, charismatic preachers, and public intellectuals in a long-running, passionate debate 
that has discussed nearly all of the possible permutations of this relationship, from the Deus absconded the dos from absent God to the conviction that God himself would fight alongside America. Historian uh, uh, Raymond Harberski, which I have mentioned in the beginning, analyzes these re recent relationship in his exquisite 2012 book, God and War, a Merkel since 1945. Of course, as you all know, other key writings that set the current debates in motion also appeared in this post-war period. First among, of course, is Robert Bellow's epoch-defining essay, Civil Religion in America, which in 1968 gave a name to this concept. Uh, a year later, the Locos Classicos American Millennial Role was published earnestly to the Redeemer Nation. Uh, other important titles and other pieces important for their titles include Civil Religion, a Dialogue in the History of Political Philosophy, Spiritual Weapons, Spiritual Weapons, The Cold War and the Forging of the American National Religion, and God's Democracy. God's democracy, American religion after September 11. After 1945, now I come to my last part, the political discourse on war and God started with President Harry <coughs> Truman and the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Truman justified his awful responsibility to drop the bombs on the two Japanese cities in a prayer and I quote from this prayer. We thank God that he has come to us instead of our enemies, and we pray that he may guide us to use the bombs in his way and for his purposes. Elements of the justification of using nuclear weapons have been a part of American public consciousness for decades. In 1940, 1994, when I took up my position in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian Institution nearly had to surrender to the public unconditionally. One of America's foremost complexes of historical memory at the heart of the capital, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, faced a relentless fusillade of furious criticism for its insuffic insufficiently heroic exhibition, depicting the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as which particular images should be included in the exhibit. Meanwhile, the Enola Gay, the Enola Gay, the plan from which the bombs were dropped, occasioned a unanimous Senate resolution in 1994 declaring that the bombs in the Pacific, Pacific brought the war to a merciful end. A merciful end. President Eisenhower shared Truman's belief that ideas were as important to the Civil War as bombs. So, Cold War as bombs. On Flag Day, June 14, 1954, Eisenhower signed a bill that made Lincoln's phrase under God an official part of the Pledge of Allegiance. The President declared, We are affirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace or in war. Perhaps more revealing, however, was his famous dictum, our form of government has no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. The former, former World War II commander believed, I quote, there are no atheists in foxholes, there are no atheists in foxholes. In the times of test and trial, we instinctively turn to God for new courage and peace of mind. Eisenhower's uh, confident young successor, President John F. Kennedy, also proclaimed his faith in the American civil religion. Kennedy, to, Kennedy turned to God to help him and the nation to prevent a military catastrophe of biblical proportions in the nuclear age. This prayer contrasted with his inaugural address, in which he had proclaimed that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, to oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. In practice, fortunately, Kennedy followed his prayers rather than his heroic rhetoric. 
He was able to defuse dangerous crisis in Berlin and Cuba without provoking a nuclear war, and was able to keep the escalation of conflicts in Laos and Vietnam contained. Lyndon Johnson also began his, began his presidency following the Kennedy assassination with a Manichaean view of the world, freedom against communism, and an unbroken um, confidence in the legitimacy of America's missionistic ideal of freedom. In the spring of 1968, however, developments in Vietnam and the near civil war conditions in his own country diminished, diminished his confidence and brought about a drastic change in his relationship with God, at least in his public pronouncement. Johnson and his successor, Richard Nixon, scrupulously avoided claiming God for the American side. Indeed, Johnson confessed at the National Prayer Breakfast, National Prayer Breakfast in February 1968, I quote, I can and I do tell you that in these long nights your president prays. America never stands taller than when her people go to their knees. America never stands taller than when her people go to their knees. Dixon, Nixon did not dare repeat President Lincoln's famous confession, I quote, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side because God is always right. Instead, in his annual address at the National Prayer Breakfast in February 1972, Nixon asked those gathered to pray not only for him and the nation, but also the United States would, would to the best of our ability, be on God's side. Overall, the American Vietnam War polarized the American nation and American faith communities like no other war since the Civil War. President Ronald Reagan thus saw his great mission as reconciling the American nation to itself and returning her to her trust in God and her mission of freedom. In the words, in the words of one historian, he, Reagan, secularized the nation by employing a trick um, that has become legendary. He separated the disastrous action of the state from the nearly divine nature, nature of the American promise. Actually, Reagan was following in Thomas Jefferson's footsteps here. Reagan deliberately used a triumphant interpretation of American civilization as a counterweight to Jimmy Carter's natural theology of humiliation. That's how Reagan saw it. His famous Evil Empire speech in March 1983 denounced communism and the Soviet Union as the focus of uh, evil in the modern world. Later, George W. Bush, with the help of a coterie of neoconservative revolutionaries, incorporated 9-11 into his Manichaean worldview. Bush's ideology of freedom and progress was not just a matter of import to the world, but a mission in the name of God. This compound nation turned Bush, alternately, into a warrior crusading for freedom in the name of God, or a holy warrior crusading in the name of freedom. According to Bush, the September 11th attacks sparked a great awakening of historical consciousness. In tragedy, Bush proclaimed, God is nearest. In tragedy, God is nearest. President Barack Obama likewise believes in the theology theology of American exceptionalism. For him, America represents the last best hope of Earth. He passionately rejected the position taken by Reverend Jeremiah Wright, the pastor of his church in Chicago. Wright had thundered, and let me quote, not God bless America, God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating her citizens as less than human. God damn America for as long as she acts like she is God and she is supreme. Instead, Obama used his speech accepting the Peace Nobel Prize in Oslo to justify the just war. To justify the just war. In his speech, he used the word war 44 times while using the word peace only 32 times. It was clear that for Obama, there is evil in the world, 
that must be fraught where necessary. What we then see in Obama is the continuation of a nearly 400 year old tradition. It seems for me and others that America could re relinquish this mission and its utopian ambition only when it would give up on itself. Thank you very much. So let me maybe just say that uh, uh, I, I have been recently reading uh, some uh, uh, writings by uh, this French philosopher, political uh, theorist, uh, whose name is Jacques Rancière, and uh, he uh, has a very interesting guess, I think, uh, which criticizes the ethical turn in politics and aesthetics, and uh, uh, he talks about a kind of equation between ethos um, and uh, ethics, and essentially this is a criticism of the U.S. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. there is there is a uh, yeah, yeah. belief that the way that we Americans live is the morally you know a, a, a valid uh, way of living and the other one. And, and I think that that actually your talk, uh, you know, that, that the emphasis that you put in your talk on 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 on, on the religious aspect, of course, yeah, helps yeah. to illuminate the position that he's yeah. articulating very well. Yeah. Now I think. The United States has been, is, is being criticized all over the world, all over the world, that's in Latin America, or you talk to Chinese or whatever, especially about their sense of mission. They think it's outright hypocritical, and the German students, when, when they talk about, they talk about God and they mean oil. That's a very <laughs> solid foundation, you see. And uh, in Germany, <coughs> It's really a hard sell to German students to persuade them that the Americans mean that. That it really has become a part of their own identity. And um, two years ago I was in Chile and we talked to some students over there almost the same reasoning, you see, that they cover up of material interest. But I still believe, and most Americans believe, that is the American identity. And beyond that, there is no such thing like American identity, because they are people from all over the world. Um, I once experienced a 4th of July ceremony uh, on West Capitol. It's amazing how people from all over the world are coming together, and that is a strange mixture of Pope, uh, popcorn, sweet land of liberty and all these things. Uh, but there, on these days, they are re-establishing their identity. That's what they really do. And um, last week we had a scholar from um, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Lloyd Ambrosius, and he has written three books on Brutal Wilson and his missionary aspect. And he belongs to the realist school. And at the end, having criticized this uh, aspect for decades. And I said, Lloyd, uh, will you <coughs> experience the victory of realism in your lifetime? He said, unfortunately not. <laughs> and, that's, that's, and I think we all have to come to terms with this aspect and just study it. And uh, the new thing about the uh, book of Habasque is he really, he really studied the prayer. We have this breakfast prayer, all these prayers, and they have doing them. And that has been a step in a long tradition in the United States. And I found it especially Truman praying to God whether or not he should drop the bombs. So it is. And ethnic and religions is really intertwined in this, uh, in this idea of mission. There's no separation of ethics and, of course, it's being criticized. As you remember about right, uh, his pastor in Chicago, he was criticized. There's criticism in the United States from our side, but still, I think the majority of Americans still believe in that. I have toured 48 states and have come across to all walks of life and talked to people. At the moment, especially for a German, the moment you start criticizing them, this aspect, they feel completely uneasy they withdraw and the communication almost ends at this point, which at least my experience. 
rights, rights criticism is itself theological. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and of course, there are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are theologians who are criticizing that. But that is another fear. Uh, the relation of God and the world is not exactly a new topic. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, please. If, if I can yeah, of course. a question. Um, I would like to ask you uh, what you think um, about the relatively recent, but already not so uh, new um, account by uh, Samuel Huntington, yeah. the argument that the American elites have exactly uh, uh, become more secular than ever, yeah. and that, uh, yeah. that uh, yeah. there are lots of people who are non-affiliated religiously, yeah. even if they declare to be religious and spiritual, yeah. they are non-affiliated, <laughs> and therefore they are not in touch with the American mainstream that is religious, believing in mission and so on and so forth. Your argument, I am, I'm really surprised because you seem uh, to be arguing that Obama is exactly in the uh, oh, um, yes. tradition yes. of the American sense yes. of mission, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. No connection to religion. So what, what would be your no. response to I, that? I have lived uh, in the center of New Rome for five years in Washington, you see. Of course there are cynics there. You know. There are cynics. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are um, scholars who uh, belong to the realist school. Henry Kissinger has been one for a long time. In his last books, at the very end, he, he, he praised the American mission of freedom uh, against his deep seating seated belief that the best you can have in international affair is kind of balance of power modeled of the Congress of Vienna. But, yes, but still, uh, not all of them are cynics, and then if they would like to, to have a position of influence, they cannot deny that. Uh, they cannot be expected to come up with these missionary ideas and, and uh, somehow, uh, otherwise, they are, would be regarded as un-American. So, there are cynics, but there are believers. Uh, nowadays, the Republican Party, more than the Democrat Party, I would say, who believe in the American sense of mission. It, it's a difficult thing, of course. Um, yeah, that, that's simply my answer to that, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Yeah, because the, the, the fact is, the sociological fact is also that there is an increasing share of the American population, apart from the elites, that is non-affiliated. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. As yeah. Oh, okay. that, that, and they are not affiliated to a specific church. Mm -hmm. But they still believe in American the spiritual, the spiritual. Yeah, the spiritual. You, you, and uh, they, are, they are not related to churches. Uh, you see, in the United States, we have more than 1,000 denominations, 1,000, competing for uh, the souls and the <coughs> persons of the Americans. There's so much competition going on in the religious scene, and there's all kinds of and who determines what religion is? Uh, that is determined by the state, if, um, by the tax or, uh, 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 or the department. Uh, they, they, are, they, are, they finally determine what religion is in the United States. What? The IRS. The IRS, yeah. The IRS determines what uh, religion uh, So, that's all true what you're saying. But I still, uh, if, if you tour the United States, you speak to people, it's still there. Whether they belong to a specific religious denomination, or whether they are longing for a kind of spirituality, what they are doing, or the Austins in Texas, the mega churches, uh, they have this great gospel of health and wealth, and thousands of Americans are flocking to this. And this gospel of health and wealth is part of the American promise. And you only uh, you roll up your sleeve, and uh, you act independently from the state and use your freedom, and so there are these hypotheses. I still think uh, the overall picture is still different. Yeah, yeah. If I may, it's, it's a kind of anecdote that I, I, I know two people who are members of New York LD, and okay. they just got married. Yeah. In non and they both declared themselves uh, non-religious, okay. but they got married. Yeah. in non-denominational yeah. church. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. This is something yeah. that for Europe is, yeah. I think, hard yeah. to comprehend. But yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's interesting to think that the, the Americans have elected a Catholic president. Of course, yes. They have elected a black president. Yes. 
they are probably going to elect their first woman president. It will be interesting to see if they ever, in my they, life, yeah. have yours, I elect think. either a, an agnostic yeah. or, or an atheist. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think they will do that. Yeah, Jewish, yes, but Jewish is religion. Yeah, Jewish is religion. So that is, uh, um, <clears throat> that's my solution to this whole top, topic, you see. And it's still there, and we have to cope with it, to somehow. I'm not American, but it's a fascinating part of American history. Identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.